The following half-hour show is a paid political program and is not endorsed by this station, management, or staff. The following program is sponsored by Excalibur Insurance Management Services. We welcome to today's show Thomas Hicks, Jr., who is currently the co-chairman of the Republican National Committee. It was only two years ago, in 2020, that the Democrats were proudly forecasting a blue wave across the country. They were wrong. While they did win the presidency with Joe Biden, they suffered significant losses in the House and the Senate was split 50-50. Fast forward to 2022, and it's the Republicans who have visions of a red wave sweeping across America. This is the hope of today's guest, who has traveled to 49 states this fall to push for Republican candidates. Prior to 2016's presidential election, Tom served as the National Finance Co-Chairman for the Donald J. Trump for Presidency Committee. He was vice chairman of the Finance Committee for the 2017 presidential inauguration and worked in the Trump transition team following his election in 2016 to the presidency. Tom also served on the National Advisory Board for Turning Point USA. Besides politics, Tom is a private equity investor and a director of Hicks Holding LLC. He also serves as a director for Resolute Energy Corporation. He is the son of Thomas Hicks Sr., a Texas billionaire who formerly owned the Texas Rangers of Major League Baseball as well as the Dallas Stars in the National Hockey League. Tom is a graduate of the University of Texas and lives with his wife, Alexandra, and their three daughters in Dallas. We look forward to his forecast about November 8th and why he feels so confident of a Republican wave sweeping this country. This is the Volpe Report, a weekly news and political interview show examining the latest local, state, and national issues with Chuck Volpe. Insightful, informative, controversial, the area's premier political talk show, The Volpe Report. Tom, welcome to The Volpe Report. Thank you, thanks for having me on. Well, uh, first of all, a special thank you in, the light, in light of, as co-chairman of the Republican National Committee, and as we talked off air, and I'll get to that in a second, you've been to 49 states uh, in this cycle over the last month or so, pushing the Republican messaging. Uh, the bridge to me from looking at your resume to politics was Donald Trump, and you became the national chairman of his finance committee. No, no small task not an unimportant role, as important as it gets. So talk about how you came to transition from uh, uh, running an, an investment fund and, and ha having a father who was a billionaire and owned sports teams, and you now translate this to public service. So how did you make that transition and why did you? Well, actually, it started when Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. He was, he was radical. The Democrat Party became more and more radical. So I started getting involved and donated to the Republican National Committee, found candidates I liked all over the country, true conservatives. And then Donald Trump became president. And he asked me to uh, be finance chair uh, of his campaign. Uh, we raised a lot of money. He made it easy for us. Uh, then he asked me to be co-chair of the Republican National Committee back in 2019. And so did that for two years, it's a two year term, and then ran for reelection back in 2020. I uh, thought it was really important to have continuity and leadership. Ron and McDaniel <clears throat> and I worked very well together, and we knew the Democrats were going to try to divide the Republican Party, and they're, it's not going to happen with the RNC. In my lifetime, I haven't seen, in terms of messaging, of the top seven I issues, starting with the economy and inflation and gas and energy prices and food prices, right through crime and, and continuing, I have never seen the Democrats be wrong completely wrong on more of their progressive wish list than into this midterm. I like your thoughts on that. You're absolutely right. <clears throat> We're seeing people leave the Democrat Party all over the place right now, including elected officials. Uh, some uh, as recently as Tulsi Gabbard, who ran for president as a Democrat, recently announced that she was, she's leaving the party. But the Democrats have become controlled by a radical element. And they they won the, the control of the House back in 2020 by 31,000 votes. They won the presidency by 43,000 votes combined in three states. They won the control of the Senate by 12,000 votes in Georgia. 
they're acting like they have a mandate to fu fundamentally change our country and people are, are getting mad and angry and we're using that as an opportunity to grow our party in communities that tr traditionally have not voted Republican. Hispanics, Blacks, Asian Americans, we've opened 38 community centers across the country to explain what we are as a party, what our candidates stand for, and we're trying to use this as a historic and generational opportunity to grow our party because of how radical the Democrats have become. And, and the manifestations of that, Tom, are, are, are myriad. I just saw a film the other day, uh, someone did a video, and it's gonna be a documentary, of Los Angeles. And, and, and you, see the, you see the palm trees, and you see the famous skyline of Los Angeles. But this video is right outside the downtown area of Los Angeles, into not the suburbs, but literally not a mile from Center City drug encampments, homeless encampments. There are hypodermic needles and feces on sidewalks. This, this uh, has been repeated, by the way, because in San Francisco, it's the same thing. I made reference to Michael Schellenberger's book, San Francisco, How Progressives Ruin Cities. It, it's becoming a ghost town in San Francisco. They recalled their district attorney, no less, Chesa Bowden. So, my feeling is that law and order and crime is near the top of the list of issues that, that go into this, uh, this cycle. Your thoughts on that? You're absolutely right. And we see this consistently across the country in almost every single city or state that is run by a Democrat. And they want to defund the police. That obviously makes it less safe for communities. Um, but another issue that people are focused on is, is inflation, which is just been destroying the, the middle class of America. And it, it's very painful. I do get to travel across the country. I talk to people all over the place. This is very real. And we've basically given up. The average family has given up a month of their annual salary because of this inflation mess. It's painful. You know, ironically, uh, one of the things, Tom, we've talked about on this show is that if you didn't know how bad it was, you don't have to listen to Republican messaging you can look at the Democratic messaging. And basically, they're talking about mainly two things. They're talking about the January 6th hearings in committee on what happened on January 6th as an ex existential threat to our country, um, one. Two, they're talking about abortion. James Carville, one of the top Democratic strategists of the last half century, has said, quote, Democrats have to stop saying abortion every other word. That's from a Democratic strategist. Your thoughts on, on, on some of what their messaging is? Well, I'll also quote Carville. It's the economy, stupid. And <laughs> I mean, think about what's really affecting Americans. It's the kitchen table issues. And it, it, it has been one disaster after another for Democrats, whether it's at home or abroad. And the people across the country want change. People are mad. They're enthusiastic about Republicans. Our, our turnout for primaries is up across the board in almost every single state. So we're excited about the opportunity to continue to grow the party. We're fully invested in, in getting people out to vote. That's the most important thing, turnout. We have to get our people out to vote, and that's what our job is. Right. Um, you, you mentioned that you're involved not just in the federal offices, you're very involved in governor's races, of course. Uh, uh, I, I would assume even state legislatures in certain places. but. Of the crop of governor races, I believe there are 36 seats that are open for governor, including ours in Pennsylvania. Uh, our Republican candidate is not faring so well. What we need in Pennsylvania, honestly, Tom, is a runoff system where if you have 12 people running, you can't win with 30-some percent and it just goes straight to the primary. You have to get to 50 so the top two would run off. Had that happened, we had two or three candidates that were, were, would have beaten Josh Shapiro, the Democratic nominee. We got one so far right, unfortunately. Uh, it's it's a, a, not a good campaign, very little money, m big, a big deficit in the polls. But having s Pennsylvania side, uh, what are the other, other governor's races? I believe there are 20 Republicans that are currently holders of the incumbency and 16 Democrats out of those 36. So what is your feel around the country? I'm sure we cover all of Northeast and Central Pennsylvania in this media market. 
I'm sure they'd be interested to hear what's going on outside of Pennsylvania. Look, we're, we're going to be helpful in every single race. I mean, look, are you better off today than you were two years ago with Democrat policies? The answer is no. And Democrats have all been taken over by this radical element. Uh, so we need to make sure that we elect Republican governors and attorney generals. So when we win back the House and we win back the Senate, we're still going to have um, an administration that, that is not afraid to break the rules and and work for the American people. So it's up to the governors and the attorney generals to protect our freedoms at home. Governor Ron DeSantis and, of course, Governor uh, Greg Abbott of Texas, your state, have been busing and or flying uh, illegal migrants around the country to Democratic blue cities, Washington, D.C., New York City's declared a crisis, by the way, Mayor Eric Adams recently, and of course, Martha Vineyard. And it, it, what's amazing is the blatant apparent hypocrisy of the elitist democratic uh, uh, progressives that, oh my God, this is a crisis. They've accused Governor DeSantis of kidnapping and uh, I think human trafficking, no less. All, all he did, of course, was let the northern progressive cities that live in this isolated cocoon of disbelief and utopia, or that this is a moral issue and here's what we need to do, without understanding the harm they've inflicted on the border cities in the South. So let me get your thoughts on immigration. That's got to be one of the biggest issues, I believe it is. It's a very big deal in my home state of Texas. I mean, I think we get 7,000 illegal crossings per day. Think about the stretch on resources for our smaller communities in South Texas. It's a, it's a big deal. Uh, but this is a problem across the country. Uh, fentanyl is, is the number one killer for people who are 18 to 49 years old. Uh, without With a porous border, that is smuggled into our country. But every the Biden administration has also been shipping uh, people to other other cities, and I don't hear the Democrats whining about that. So it's it, it, they're full of hypocrisy, and we've just got to build the wall and protect our southern border. Five million people is inexcusable. Right, and 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 the the, the amazing part for me is I, I I quote John F. Kennedy on this after the Bay of Pigs. He famously said, "An error doesn't become a mistake unless you refuse to correct it." The thing I'm having difficulty with, Tom, is that how do you not correct some of the apparent mistakes that have hurt our country? Let's be just selfish and talk about, even from selfish motivation, why the Democrats wouldn't reverse their position on the catastrophe of what they've done to shut down all oil drilling and natural gas, the Keystone XL pipeline. The, the immigration is a crisis that's manifest for everybody in this country. Kamala Harris goes on on, on uh, uh, Face the Nation or whatever it was, meet the press, I'm sorry, and says our border is secure. I, I mean, how could they be that tone deaf? Just an opinion. I, I mean, how do you miss these things? It's tragic and they're, they're consistent about it. And it's, we've, we've got to win back the House and the Senate and then the presidency in 2024 in order to put, a, put an end to this madness. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous what they're doing. Let's, in your, in your position as co-chair of the, of the RNC, uh, Tom, that's interesting because I'd like to now look forward. Let's look past. Let's look to 2024. If the Republicans, as I believe, will overwhelmingly take the House and take the Senate, obviously the, the presidency is like the queen if you play chess. The queen on a chessboard can forgive a lot of sins. <clears throat> uh, it almost would be self-defeating not to then to have gotten Congress and continue stalemate as we've just are going to probably do in Pennsylvania, by the way, with our governor's race, uh, you know, so kind of go through, you're, you're going to be directly involved in the Republican National Committee, obviously, as the primaries get underway, probably next year, they'll be starting. So what is your view of the crop of Republican hopefuls and the future of the Republican Party for the presidency? Well, I think it's a very strong future. We have a, a number of very talented uh, conservative people who are rumored to be running in 2024. Everybody's focused on November 8th, 2022, though. And so I think uh, if you if you compare that to what you're seeing on the Democrat side, there's nobody. They have nobody. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, uh, he's, a, he's a failed mayor of a small town. And so the, the, who is it? Yeah, I looked at I looked at some of the prospects, as I mentioned earlier, and I 
You have Kamala Harris. You have Governor uh, Gavin Newsom, who was recalled in his own state. He survived it, by the way, but, but was recalled in his own state. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's again, it's a far left, uh, ultra radical progressive message. And, you know, I, I don't know who will emerge, but my feeling is that somewhere out there, there will be a moderate, a responsible Democrat. I think one thing Democrats will do after November 8 that you're going to be faced with dealing with from the Republican side, I think you're going to see a sprint back to the center when they get their heads handed to them on November 8th. They're going to realize that those failed policies are failed. The American people want none of it. In fact, adamantly don't want any of it. So it'll be interesting to, to me to see how this, uh, I have a pretty good feel, I think, for, for the potential Republican candidates that are somewhat signaling. And I agree. I had, uh, I think, Mick Mulvaney was on this show about three weeks ago, Tom. And uh, he kind of talked about how deep the bench was for the Republicans. So uh, the primary season should be interesting. So let me ask, throw it back to you. What role does the RNC play, uh, uh, if any, in the primaries? Or do you kind of let, let it all work out? We let it work out. We let, we let the Republicans choose who their candidates can be. We put on the convention and we have a celebration for whoever he or she is on our side. And then we march towards the finish line in November of 2024. Well, I, I, you'll agree, I think, that uh, uh, that it's kind of self-defeating if, if it, you have a great November 8th, and I think you will, and, and you get control of Congress, and I think you will, to then not, not win the presidency. You, you, you know, the country goes back into stalemate again for four more years, so I'm sure uh, your resources and efforts will be, uh, in that regard, pushed forward. Yeah, and I hope our candidate comes up with some big Republican ideas that we can run with for a generation or two. And so I think I think we have candidates who are capable of doing just that. We're focused on making sure the economy's humming along for all Americans, uh, keep unemployment low, uh, protect our borders, have standing internationally, energy dominance. Those are the things that Republicans can deliver to our country. And after after two years of failure, I think the American people are thirsty for that. They're going to, people are not going to forget some of these blue state lockdown policies that, that harmed their citizens, what they did. And this radical element controls the Democrat party. I don't know if they can go to the center. You know, I'm having trouble myself seeing how it can happen because they would have to effectively admit that they were historically wrong in myopic in their, in their view of this country to get there. You know, again, like as again, John F. Kennedy famously said, an, you know, an error, uh, you know, doesn't have to become a mistake unless you refuse to correct it. I don't know how they admit, admit the error because to me, it's been so plain for all to see. Let, let's talk a little bit about what we haven't talked about yet, but I'd just like your thoughts from your position. The compromise to our national security, Tom, you know, I did shows on here with uh, Eugene Barr, Pennsylvania's president of the Pennsylvania Chamber of Commerce and others, and we effectively predicted, this is prior to the Ukraine invasion, effectively predicted that Putin was playing the long game and we weren't, that he was compromising our position, giving carrots. We actually had Russian tankers rolling up United States interstates in the Northeast here to places like New York State delivering Russian oil because they've shut down all drilling in New York State, all fracking. They don't have any natural gas being extracted. They've shut down our pipelines to Pennsylvania hurting us. And it, it, it appeared to me and Gene Barr and others at the time that our NATO allies are on bended knee to Vladimir Putin begging for oil to keep their citizens from freezing to death, by the way, in Europe that that would not bode well because he effectively had a position of, 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 I use the word Trump, not as the president, but if you play pinochle, what a Trump card does, it takes the hand. He had Trump over all of our allies to basically mitigate any response to his invasion. And then of course we get the invasion. You know, again, what were they thinking? What shutting down, the National Review had a headline this week that the decarbonization of Europe has so destabilized the entire European continent, now they're begging for oil from OPEC, Saudi Arabia, and Vladimir Putin. So let me have your thoughts. You need to have a worldview, your Republican national co-chair, obviously, about 
the issue of we haven't talked about, they've weakened our position and destabilized the geopolitical balance. Take it from there. Well, I mean, if you think about it rationally, when you have the ability to be energy dominant, you should do that. Uh, when you're not, the whole world changes. And, you know, right in, right in your backyard in Pennsylvania, you've got an unbelievable amount of natural gas just sitting there waiting to be exported globally. And that's that can provide tens and tens of thousands of very high paying jobs to Pennsylvania families. It's common sense governance ap approach, in my opinion, and not one Democrat that I know of is in favor of championing uh, gas, natural gas production in Pennsylvania. We are, are uh, and you come from a state that's uh, has historically and, and into the future uh, overwhelming the number one energy producer in, in the country, in Texas. And Pennsylvania, believe it or not, is second, Tom. That's the amount of fossil fuel, right. oil, and natural gas, oceans of it underneath. And, and you know what? You don't know this because they outlawed all drilling and all natural gas extraction. Bigger than us is probably New York State. They have a continent under, under their uh, territory of this, and they've, they've just outlawed it. As I said, they were getting Russian oil delivered to heat and warm their citizens in New York. I, I can't believe I'm even having this conversation, but again, this apocalyptic, the world is coming to an end strategy by the Democrats. I sit on my TV at night, like you do, I'm sure, and I see on an average 20 commercials during the Major League Baseball playoffs of electric cars. Who can afford them? I'm pretty sure the overwhelming majority of Americans, working class Americans used to be that for the Democratic Party, no longer. So your kind of uh, view of, of how, you've already mentioned Hispanics and blacks and Asian Americans are coming over to the Republican Party. Let me get your thoughts on why that's happening and, and how it's happening. Because Democrat policies just are not working right now for for the American people. I mean, it's common sense approach to to governing. Uh, some of this ESG stuff is is just shows you that the Democrat Party is in the pocket of the green lobby, and that's that's what it is. And uh, they they control the Democrat Party. They're making bad decisions that hurt the American people. And we we are the party of liberty. Uh, we want to to have you know the ability to decide what kind of car we can we want to drive we want to pay two dollars or less per gallon of gasoline instead of four uh you can do that with common sense uh policy energy production and that's that's basically it right well one of the other uh subjects we've hit hard in this show time is that the uh the misguided uh use of science to have a basically a pointed political agenda and ideology. That uh, there are things like confirmation bias. Uh, they have hit a historical high in what they call non-repeatable results of scientific studies. When they do all this testing and feed it all this data and they get various findings from the data, well, it's supposed to be consistently within a margin of error, repeatable as they continue to test. Well, over almost 55% is not repeatable. In fact, the one expert that I quoted on this show, his quote was, you have a better chance of flipping a coin. So one of the things when every, we keep hearing about we're following the science, usually you're hearing from far left progressive Democrats that are following the science. Your thoughts, because you've made reference to how we have been shut down in Pennsylvania and other states, destroying our economies. Tens of thousands of businesses have been forever shuttered. Millions have lost jobs. So your thoughts on that uh, component, because to me, the democratic progressive far left is weaponizing science to make people afraid so they'll follow their mandates. Your thoughts? Well, you know, what we need to do is elect Republicans this November to start the process of turning our country around. And when we do that, we need to clean up Washington, D.C. Uh, it's it's full of bureaucrats who are unelected, who do not serve in the best interest of the American people. And I think that's what you're alluding to. Exactly, Tom. That's that's the point. And uh, there's there's evidence for that. Well, uh, as we kind of draw this show comes kind of to an end now at this point, I kind of would like uh, in terms of your overview of what's at stake November 8th. We've kind of alluded to it in different parts of the show, but in, in summary, in summation, uh, why? 
Americans should vote Republican this November 8th? First of all, we are going to win the House and the Senate back. And that's going to that's going to start the process of healing our country. Uh, but if you care about uh, energy independence, if you care about secure borders, if you care about inflation, being able to put put food on the table for your family, you're going to vote Republican. We need we need all of you to help turn out the vote. We, we've got a great team on the ground in Pennsylvania. We're, we're growing and growing. We have over a million volunteers across the country to go turn out that vote. So we've got 19 days left, and let's do it. Well, very well stated, Tom. I wanna to thank you again for your time uh, on this show and uh, eloquently stating what the issues are uh, and uh, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> so thanks again, Tom, have a great day. Thank you, you too. As you are aware, I have been hitting the issue of crime pretty hard. You also know that there is a clear and empirical connection between crime and the woke progressive Democratic leadership in the blue states and cities where crime is most prevalent. I have talked about the disgraces of Waukesha, Wisconsin, and Michael Schellenberger's book, San Francisco, Why Progressives Ruin Cities. Now, it's finally much closer to home, right here in Philadelphia with Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner. If you fed the ingredients to produce pure wokeness into a computer, it would spit out Krasner, an extremely rich, white, progressive elitist who believes he has a fundamental right to dictate social policy to everyone else, ostensibly for the benefit of people of color. However, true leaders of people of color are people of color, like African-American former mayor of Philadelphia, Michael Nutter who understands white, woke progressives like Krasner are wolves in sheep's clothing, not committed to equity, but political power. The issue was sparked when D.A. Krasner called a press conference recently to say with a straight face that Philadelphia doesn't have a crime problem, despite a record number of murders so far this year, 521. Krasner stated, and I quote, we don't have a crisis of lawlessness, we don't have a crisis of crime, there is not a crisis of violence, but there is a crisis of gun violence. What? This is just a type of woke progressive speak garbage that is insulting to all human beings. To disingenuously suggest that murders by gun can be distinguished from other murders is ridiculous, especially since overall murder is at record numbers. Thankfully, former Mayor Michael Nutter called his own press conference and answered far better than me. Quote, 521 people Souls have been vanquished, eliminated, the most since 1960. I have to wonder what kind of messed up world of white wokeness Krasner is living in to have so little regard for human lives lost, many of them black and brown, while he advances his own national profile as a progressive district attorney. I'd like to ask Krasner, how many more black and brown people and others would have to be gunned down in our streets daily to meet your definition of a crisis? How many more children and teens have to die in record numbers to capture your attention and be considered a crisis? As someone who has lived the experience of a black man in Philadelphia and worked at the highest levels of city government, I see that police and judges are trying to keep Philadelphians safe, but Krasner is not. No matter what he says, the city is experiencing a crisis of violence and murder. If he can't see that, he is unfit to serve the residents of Philadelphia.